Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah. Among the most foundational beliefs of Muslims is that the Quran is the divine, preserved, unparalleled speech of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The Quran itself challenges those who deny it to produce something like it, if they are truthful in their claim. This is known as the eternal challenge of the Quran and it's part of showing that the Quran could not have been authored by anyone but Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. What does it mean for the Quran to be a miracle? How do we know it is in fact a miracle? What are the proofs? How does this knowledge affect our relationship with Allah and with his book? Welcome to Double Take, a podcast by Yaqeen Institute about the questions and ideas around Islam and Muslims that give us pause. Remember to subscribe and rate the show on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, YouTube, or wherever you listen to your favorite podcasts. It makes a big difference. Also, consider sharing your thoughts directly with our team using the link in the description below. Let us know what you like, you dislike, and want to see more of. Today was honestly an enjoyable episode. It was pretty fun actually. My guest Sheikh Suleiman Hani's research into the miracles of the Quran was so refreshing. Sheikh Suleiman is the Director of Academic Affairs at Al Maghrib Institute. He's a research scholar for Yaqeen Institute and a resident scholar in Michigan. He earned a master's degree from the University of Jordan's College of Sharia, ranking first in his class, and a master's degree from Harvard University, where he studied religions, philosophy, political science, and psychology. Sheikh Suleiman is the author of the Yaqeen Institute paper, Introduction to Ijaz al-Quran, The Miraculous Nature of the Quran. Enjoy the episode. Sheikh Suleiman Hani, assalamu alaikum and welcome to Double Take. Wa alaikum assalam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Barakallahu fikum. Sheikh Suleiman, there's a very intriguing conversation in the Quran between Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and the Prophet Ibrahim alayhi salam, where Ibrahim alayhi salam says, Oh Allah, show me, adini kayfa tuhyil mawta, show me how you bring life back from the dead. To which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Do you not believe? And Ibrahim responds, Of course I do, but just so that my heart is at ease. And then the conversation continues. Allah resurrects four birds in front of Ibrahim alayhi salam. Today, Sheikh Suleiman, I'm going to ask you about the miraculous nature of the Quran. As a practicing Muslim, alhamdulillah, I believe the Quran is Allah's word and that it is in fact a miracle. But just so that my heart is at rest, I'm going to ask you to guide me through the proof that it is in fact a miracle. We'll get there sometime inshallah in this conversation. But before we do, I do want to say at the outset that I'm very intrigued and interested in what got you into this in the first place. What sparked your interest in exploring the miraculous nature of the Quran? So generally speaking, I've always been interested in the pursuit of truth in comparative religions, in discussing the philosophy of religion, uh, even at a young age, alhamdulillah, for myself first and foremost, uh, and I praise uh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, I thank him. Uh, the credit goes back to my parents as well, who from a very young age, they've been emphasizing these matters. So at the age of high school, secondary school, I remember being engaged in a lot of online conversations, sometimes debates, sometimes dialogue about uh, da'wah, the proofs of Islam. But with this topic in particular, with this topic, the miraculous nature of the Quran in particular, uh, it was two things. First, it was the phase of my life in which I started to learn more about the proofs of why Islam was true rather than an alternative, rather than something else. And partly because of how overwhelmingly uh, convincing, how obvious it was uh, through this topic, through Ijaz al-Quran, uh, that Islam was the truth. And so this was useful for me as a Muslim, but most importantly at that phase, uh, after learning about it, was being able to uh, talk to others, articulate this to others, interacting with so many people, so many uh, people who left Christianity, atheism, agnosticism, and became Muslim through mostly, primarily, this conversation, the miraculous nature of the Quran. And I, I've had, yani, to be very frank, in the last uh, maybe 15 years, uh, I think I've had at least, I, I'm, I'm being very conservative here, at least a thousand conversations uh, in which one part of the conversation focused on uh, the miraculous nature of the Qur'an. And it led to, alhamdulillah, uh, in most cases it led to clarity for the other individuals. 
Uh, and in many cases, they, they did become Muslim. And I don't mind sharing some of these stories if we have time, inshallah. Yeah, no, please, please, please. I mean, uh, a thousand, from a thousand conversations, can you pluck one or two that you just go back to and say, Alhamdulillah, wow, that was a great experience. So I, I can share uh, two, inshallah. Ta'ala. The first is actually somebody who left Islam, uh, a young American Muslim raised by what seems to be a practicing Muslim family, uh, Islamic school for a number of years. Uh, memorized the Quran at one point. Uh, he said later on that he had not uh, fully maybe understood it or uh, studied Aqidah properly. He felt some things were missing. But anyway, long story short, he left Islam for several years and he was finally willing to talk to someone. He traveled uh, from another state to where I'm living. And long story short, we had a conversation, Alhamdulillah, that was very fruitful and primarily focused on the Ajaz al-Quran. Now, as we were talking about the miraculous nature of the Quran, I listed maybe 10 examples, and maybe these are things we'll talk about later, inshallah ta'ala. But when I started listing all these proofs that the Qur'an is clearly from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he said, well, you know, these four or five are very convincing. He said, but these over here, and he started listing, you know, a few of them that he said, I don't feel fully convinced by these. And before I could respond, alhamdulillah, one of my colleagues, a dear brother, he basically said to him, do you need all 10 proofs for you to be convinced that it's the truth? Or is one of them sufficient? Think about it intellectually and in terms of your heart. Your heart knows that some of these are very clear, obvious proofs that the Quran is from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We did not need to talk about refuting what he had gone through of atheism, agnosticism, or anything else. It was providing a positive argument that the Quran that you kind of, you have a relationship with or you had in the past, you already know, you already have an idea deep down that a, a big part of it is very obvious to you that the Quran is from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You don't need multiple proofs. You need one or two very obvious ones. And he said, you're right, that makes sense. The very next day, alhamdulillah, he traveled back home. It was a long, beautiful conversation that we had. He traveled back home and his family informed us that he had made wudu or took a shower rather, uh, made ghusl so he could head out for uh, fajr prayer at the mosque for the first time in several years. And it doesn't always happen this way, where in one conversation, a person is, uh, their fitrah, their natural dispositions, awakening enough to know that was that was clearly overwhelming in terms of how obvious it is that it's true. But alhamdulillah, he came back to Islam and he's uh, still steadfast upon it. May Allah grant him success. Uh, but we usually have conversations over the course of months or years before someone is, is convinced. So the stories that I'm sharing or that people hear in which in one conversation, someone is finally you know, awakened or enlightened intellectually and spiritually. It's not the usual case, but it does happen, especially when there's some good in that individual and how uh, sincere they are in pursuing what is true. Allah Ta'ala Alam. JazakAllah Khair. We're going to get into, inshallah, the miracles in a few moments. Um, but just so that we're clear in this conversation, do you mind just defining what a miracle is in the context of the Qur'an and your study of the Qur'an? Uh, that's actually a really important question. JazakAllah Khairan for asking. Uh, a miracle in, let's say, the English language and in Western philosophy and in various religions will mean different things. So sometimes when people say this and that, this is a miracle, uh, it's actually really important that it's defined. So what you're doing here in terms of uh, defining it first is very crucial. Uh, the, the miracle that we are defining in terms of uh, mu'ajiza is the breaking of customs, kharq al-'ada in Arabic, which means something that people cannot do. It doesn't necessarily mean it has to be a uh, physical miracle that is uh, basically a violation of the natural laws, like the splitting of the Red Sea, right? That's one example that a lot of people refer to, but it's essentially something that violates all customs so that no human being can do it. So it is not natural, but rather supernatural. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uh, caused this to occur, whatever it may be that we are referring to in that context. And it's something that human beings cannot do. And it's a clear proof that, that, uh, that the, the force is supernatural and a clear proof, let's say, if a prophet is coming to his people and there's a miracle in this sense, it's a clear proof this person is coming from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. They were chosen and they were given this miracle as a sign. And so with the Quran, we are also referring to it as a clear mu'ajiza, as a clear miracle of God. So that anyone after Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam until the end of times, meaning after he departs, not just during his lifetime, till the end of times when people claim they're looking for signs of God, the existence of God, the truth of religion, the truth of life, 
all of these can be answered with a timeless miracle. And that is what we are claiming the Qur'an is, and that's what we are proving through these discussions on Ijaz al-Qur'an. So it's something that defies the laws of nature? Is that just one example, or is that kind of the main definition? No, that's just one example. So the, the laws okay. of nature, usually because people are referring to the laws of nature in a very specific way, and it's usually dealt with uh, in science and the philosophy of science, but we will say that the breaking of all customs, meaning things that no human being can possibly do. Fair enough. Fair enough. Jazakallah khair. And um, like usually when we study Quran, alhamdulillah, this season of Double Take, we we did journey through many aspects of the Quran um, and we connected to the Quran in various ways. One of those ways was to fully understand the value of tadabbur and contemplation. Um, what would you say is the main reason we need to study the miraculous nature of the Quran? Like we do usually study tafsir. We usually study uh, tajweed, you know, how to recite the Quran properly. Um, we understand, you know, Asbab al-Nuzul, for example, the reason certain verses are, uh, are revealed to the Prophet ﷺ and to, to humankind. But usually when I hear the miraculous nature, it's, it's like a given, you know, okay, the Quran is a miracle. And then we park that um, to the side and maybe pluck that conversation once every blue moon. But why do you think it should be prioritized for Muslims, for us to really understand the miraculous nature of the Quran? That's a beautiful question. Uh, this can be answered in a number of ways. So uh, I, I would start by saying that it is the foundation of truth. Anyone who claims to be looking for the truth in life, uh, whether or not they previously thought it was impossible or difficult to find truth, uh, when they study Ijaz al-Qur'an, the miraculous nature of the Qur'an, it becomes, it become, uh, becomes very obvious. So it becomes uh, explicit. It's a type of light that really uh, you, you cannot deny, you cannot ignore. And if someone is asking for evidence of which religion is true as well, not just the existence of God, the Qur'an serves as a proof for that. Uh, so for Muslims, let's say in particular with this, uh, with this half answer here, directed at Muslims in particular, no doubt whatsoever, it is a preservation of Iman, the preservation of one's faith. It's also a boost uh, to one's uh, Iman, belief in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. One of the things that I noticed is that with this topic, it motivates Muslims to really connect with the Qur'an on a daily basis. For some Muslims, they described the study of this topic, Irjaz al-Qur'an. Uh, they described one moment through, let's say, a, a series, an article, a book, in which there was a type of um, like awakening, a recognition, like it really clicked for some people. This really is the speech of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. I have to connect with it more often. And so it, it adds a level of motivation that you cannot find anywhere else. Uh, and then of course, you, you end up taking it as a source of guidance for all matters, uh, for judgment, for morality revealed through the Quran and of course explained by the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. It has within it the solutions for all of our problems and for society's issues and all the things people are talking about, all the things we are distracted by at dunya, the Quran uh, and, and the speech of Allah Subh'anaHu Wa Taala reminds us of what is prioritized as a high priority. What is a low priority? What is good? What is evil? How to resolve this? How to resolve that? Relationships, morality, laws, interactions, all types of things that we need. It's a framework for life. And I'll, I'll add to this a quick story if I have just like two minutes to add this. And I, I know my answer was directed at Muslims, but in the event that uh, someone is able to take this and share with a friend, family member, a colleague, someone who is struggling with atheism, uh, wherever it may be in their families or communities, or an atheist who may be listening to this. This is one of many conversations where someone would say to me, an atheist usually or an agnostic, prove to me that God exists. Can you provide any explicit, obvious proof? And I would say uh, as a response, and I, I urge people to think about this question and utilize it often, what what suffices as proof for you? What would convince you to finally believe in God? Like what, what kind of proof are you thinking about in your mind that would be enough of a proof? Because we've had conversations with people who said they wouldn't believe in God even if they could see God. They would imagine that they're hallucinating, that it's a trick, that it's something else. I said you really would never believe in God under any circumstances. And there are people who wouldn't. Now I know that is maybe the minority uh, of uh, atheist even perhaps, and I, I, I don't know, that may be anecdotal, 
But for those who say they would believe if there was a proof, it's very important to start off that conversation by asking, what would convince you? What kind of proof? Because some people limit their terms, the, the types of proofs they'll accept. So, for example, a lot of my conversations start like this, and the very first few questions are exactly the same, and then it takes off in different directions. The response, for example, from one person was, and he left atheism, alhamdulillah, that, that's the conclusion of this. But the, the response was, uh, I would believe in God if I could see God before my eyes right now, or if he healed someone in front of me. And it's a very common response. It's very interesting. I said, so, okay, to understand you, to make sure I'm more clear, you would believe in God. You're, you're being very sincere in that claim, but only on the condition that, for example, one of those proofs that you're looking for is that you could see God, you could see him right now, or he would heal someone in front of you. That would convince you that God is real. He said, yeah. I said, it's very interesting that you have some terms in which you'll accept belief in God. He said, why? I said, well, is it logically possible? that there are miracles, there are evidences, there are signs, like the one you mentioned, but it's not the one you mentioned. It's not on your terms. Is it possible logically to imagine that there could be another type of sign? He said, yeah, it's possible. I said, great. How many possibilities are there? And he thought about it, and the obvious response is, it's limitless possibilities. It is limitless. You can't limit it to just God healing someone in front of your eyes, or you seeing God with your eyes. That would be very problematic. And the person would, would then be admitting that they're not really sincerely looking for evidences of God. They're limiting the, the evidence to what they want, what they desire. No, he was honest. He said it's limitless possibilities. Limitless possibilities to believing in, in the existence of God. Uh, up to this point, most of the conversations uh, make it to this point, alhamdulillah. And they take off in different directions. And what many people don't realize, and those who are listening really remember this, Someone who says what this individual has stated has made a lot of progress because they've just admitted to themselves, my terms in, in which under which I'll finally believe in God are very limited and they aren't, they aren't real, they aren't reasonable. There are limitless possibilities. That's a lot of progress. The next question is, what are some examples of other evidences that will make you, they'll convince you to believe in God that are, that are clear signs? He started listing examples. And I said, okay, I see what you're saying. Those are great examples. Here's a question to you. Is it possible that one of those signs, one of those evidences of God uh, or miracles of God, if you will, is his speech? Is it logically possible to imagine that God, I know we haven't defined God yet up to this point, but generally the notion of God, most people take it, many atheists take it from, uh, from Orthodox theism, from Christianity, sometimes generally from Islam, Christianity, Judaism, just a general idea of the creator. So I said, is it possible to imagine that God has speech and that he revealed his speech to us? And it's so obvious the speech is from God. It's mirac miraculous in a sense that nobody who, who comes across it can possibly deny that this is from God. I said, is that logically possible as one evidence of many, since you mentioned it's limitless? He thought about it. He said, yes, it is possible. It is possible, of course. I said, okay, and here's the final question. What are some examples of things that you might find in the speech of God that would be so obvious that anyone who, who were to study this topic would see clearly this is not the speech of man. Clearly, this is God's speech. So it has to be undeniable proof, very obvious. I said, what would it have to contain? And over here, he started to list. It would have to be perfect. It would have to be, uh, it would have to have information about things no humans could know because then it's an obvious proof. I said, wonderful. And as he's listing them, it would have to have objective morality because people who claim objective morality, it is rooted in God. I said, wonderful. It would have to have this and that. I said, excellent. I said, can I introduce you to the Quran? So in one of the conversations, he said, I already know about the Quran. I said, I don't think you do because what you just listed is almost identical to what we are teaching, what we already know as Muslims in the section of Irajaz al-Quran. And Alhamdulillah, after several months of conversations, he did become Muslim. Now, not every conversation ends that way. And, and that's why I mentioned up to a certain point in the conversations, you have people who progress, but then there's still some obstacle internally or externally uh, that prevents them from, from making that progress towards enlightenment and guidance and happiness. But this is why it is crucial for everyone to know that the Qur'an is miraculous. Because people who are looking for the truth, genuinely looking for the truth, may have only heard about one or two things regarding the Qur'an, and it may not even be true what they heard. 
But when they come across I'jaz al-Qur'an and they realize it's a logical possibility that what you're looking for as an evidence of God is right here, it proves both the existence of God and the miraculous nature of the Qur'an, so the proof of Islam in one. And so this person believes in God as a result, as a sincere logical result, and accepts Islam at the same time. And I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to utilize us for that form of uh, da'wah and guidance as well. I mean, Jazakallah khair. I, um, I was listening patiently because for me, your conviction is contagious, frankly. Jazakallah khair. Um, but also, you know, we grow up hearing about the value of the Qur'an in our lives. We hear that it's a shifa. We hear that it's a furqan, you know, criteria between right and wrong. Um, we hear that it's light. Um, but we genuinely don't spend enough time looking at this aspect of the Qur'an and solidifying our belief and appreciation of the Qur'an. So if I was to ask you a very simple question, prove to me that this is a miracle, that this is Allah's word. And if I was to ask you for kind of the ultimate proof or the ace of hearts, could you could you choose the one miracle that you would use in, in most of those conversations? That's a beautiful question. I would say it depends on the person I'm speaking to. Because I found in, in pretty much all these conversations with Muslims and non-Muslims and ex-Muslims who became Muslims, alhamdulillah, that uh, it really depends on the person's inclination. So some people are naturally inclined towards a lot of skepticism, radical skepticism, arbitrary doubts. And so with those individuals, I might use, for example, I might discuss uh, the knowledge of the future found in the Quran. And I've noticed, and this is the reason that I'll mention this uh, frequently, I've noticed that one in particular has really impacted uh, a number of people or knowledge of the natural world, what some people claim to be is called the scientific miracles of the Quran. I don't like to say scientific miracles of the Quran and that's a conversation for another time perhaps, but uh, basically knowledge about the natural world that nobody could have known about back then, um, like embryology, for instance. And then I found that with many Muslims, uh, the language was impactful for some people, the literary miracle of the Quran, the usage of specific words and the tying in the, the perfection and tying in of the word that's used with the grammatical uh, structure of the ayah, the verse, with the sound that you're hearing all at once in different places in the Quran, even when the, the same story is being shared from different vantage points or different details, subhanAllah. Uh, I've noticed for many people, it was the impact that the Quran had on their hearts and their lives. And so I, I do ask this question frequently, the question you just asked me, uh, and I'll, I'll sometimes phrase it as follows. What is the most compelling proof for you that the Quran is the speech of uh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala or where the non-Muslims or the non-Muslim will say the speech of God? And for many, for many Muslims, it seems to be the personal impact or the guidance in the Quran. Uh, a spiritual, psychological benefit, the recitation, the shifa for the heart, shifa lima fi sudur, as Allah says, a healing for what is in the hearts, a physical shifa as well for those who've experienced it. Uh, for some people, it's the fact that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives us all that we need of morality, purpose of life, why we exist, where we're headed, who is God, the attributes of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So we don't need to be worrying about making up some worldview, some uh, arbitrary religion, some subjective values that change every few years. And so for some people, that was uh, sufficient. Uh, I wouldn't say that I, I have um, an ace of hearts or a favorite one. I, I really emphasize with this uh, topic that people take a step back and see the full picture and then start to appreciate the different facets of Ijaz. Uh, personally, listening to the Quran and studying the, the linguistic miracle has always moved me. And that's a miracle that's found uh, obviously from beginning to end in terms of the uh, Quran. Uh, so when, well, you, when you say yeah. linguistic miracle, I, I want to get into the different categories, but let's just use the one that you're, you're very passionate about, linguistic miracle. Just you mind going a little bit deeper as to why its miraculous nature is um, is defined by by language? So uh, it's not as easy at times to explain the, uh, the the miracle that is linguistic and literary, but you'll see that. And for those who read the article, and I urge you to read the series in Ta'ala, we listed uh, ten different examples of what what the mir miracle, the literary miracle, comprises of. So you'll find, for example, the 
choice of words, the word choice with the grammar, as I mentioned, with the sound that's made all in the best form possible. Uh, you'll find that the tenses that are used, the past versus present, uh, plural versus singular, uh, to illustrate deeper meanings in a particular passage of the Quran is done in a very, uh, in a way beyond uh, human capacity. Um, the combination of detail with uh, being concise in certain uh, areas of the Quran, as well as having a lot of richness in meaning with the least amount of words possible. Uh, you find just generally the rhythm of the Qur'an in different uh, passages uh, and how they impact us and how they impact the sound that you are hearing when you are listening to the Qur'an. You find the voice of the Qur'an, obviously the word voice here, we're using it very uh, loosely, but the voice of the Qur'an is very bold, very strong, uh, and it's appealing to both reason and uh, to one's heart. Uh, it's appealing to al-aqil, the intellect, as well as the natural uh, disposition that we have the fitra while establishing compelling proofs, while um, positing uh, different uh, arguments, rhetorical questions to awaken people when they're misguided. And it is uh, a combination of the persuasive as well as an emotive force. And throughout the entire Quran, you find this uh, consistency in uh, tranquility with power, with boldness, with majesty that nothing can really overcome. Um, those are some of the examples, but what I think convinces people who are still learning about this topic, or maybe even non-Muslims, is the fact that it's a miracle linguistically that no human being can imitate. So the inimitability of the Qur'an, the fact that, and that's where it is a mu'jizah in that no human being can come up with anything like it. If you think about where it came from and through whom it was conveyed, Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, you realize that it was revealed sometimes in front of various audiences over the course of 23 years. And at times it was a response to a question. They ask you about, say to them, respond to them, O Muhammad as follows. So the Prophet who was known as As-Sadiq Al-Amin, the uh, truthful, the honest, the trustworthy, uh, who never lied to his people, and they said to him, you've never lied to us, we would believe you. He said, even if I were to tell you that an army was behind this hill coming to attack us, they said, we would believe you, you've never lied to us. Suddenly he receives revelation from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, a man who was known for his honesty, who never ever lied to his people. Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, who never learned language properly, meaning reading and writing, never was seen learning poetry or balagha, eloquence and rhetoric from people. Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam receiving revelation and he has no worldly ambition. Everything they offered him to stop, he would refuse to stop and he would say, this is essentially something I'm holding on to. Even if you offered me the, the, the sun and the moon, I have to continue with this mission. Why? Because it's not for people. It's not for glory. It's not for fame. He actually lost more of his uh, material uh, status or power, whatever uh, he had before, uh, although it was not much, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, uh, after he became a prophet because his pursuit was sincere. And now he's conveying a speech that no one can imitate, the, the best of Arab poets, and they're known for their poetry. And they heard it and they would say, I, I can't even imitate this. I've never heard anything like this. And this is one of many reasons that people became Muslim. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala challenged them. Uh, it's not just with the language, but the language is a big part of it. Bring something like it. If you claim that this is not true or this is not from Allah, then go ahead and bring something like it. And they couldn't, and they failed. Revealed in over the course of 23 years, and it wasn't even chronological. Verses that were not revealed uh, sometimes in a long surah like Surah Al-Baqarah, the longest chapter of 286 verses. The final verse that came down was Ayah 281, and that was towards the, the last uh, 10 days of the life of the Prophet So it's important to consider the linguistic miracle in the context of who conveyed it. Prophet Muhammad وسلم, whose speech as a human being was actually different than the Quran, as actually some studies have found. For those who read the articles, you know this, uh, that hadith in you know, Sahih al-Bukhari, for example, were compared, and this was done through a number of studies, compared to the words in the Quran. And they found that it was significantly different. Uh, more than maybe 60% of the words used uh, in the Qur'an were not found in Sahih al-Bukhari and vice versa. So it's clearly two different uh, voices and, and speeches, Wallah ta'ala alam. And when you say Wallah ta'ala alam, uh, I'm just reminding those who are listening, Allah knows best, meaning in terms of the uh, argument that is literary for you to explore. There's so much more to say about it. In fact, we, we can easily say that this is the most discussed uh, aspect of the ijaz of the Qur'an. You'll find you'll find tens of thousands of uh, pages of, of writing just on this one topic. 
I was going to say, I'm glad you mentioned uh, uh, Surah Al-Baqarah because my knowledge of the miraculous nature of the Quran is probably limited to, to one thing I heard when I was growing up about uh, how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uses numbers in the Quran and like there's certain mathematical kind of uh, interesting nuggets that exist in the Quran such as when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says uh, um, that we created you a, a middle uh, ummah or a moderate ummah and um, literally the, the, the exact middle of Surah Al-Baqarah is where he meant when where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions that. But clearly my knowledge of this uh, is very limited. Um, you could have gone on for ages with regards to the lit literary miracle of the Quran. Um, do you mind just uh, listing the 10, just for our audiences who haven't read the article or who are not familiar with the different categories of miracles that exist? Sure, uh, and I and for those who are interested, these are listed in the uh, paper itself. So uh, the first is the inimitability of the Quran, the fact that it cannot be imitated by human beings. Uh, number two is the literary or linguistic miracle of the Quran. Number three is the preservation of the Quran, that it is the unchanged speech of God until the modern world, meaning for the last 1400 years. Uh, and obviously for many people who left Christianity and other religions towards Islam, for many of them, they said this was a very important category of urgence. Number four is the knowledge about the future. Uh, and this is uh, going to be found in the upcoming paper, inshallah. Number five is the lost knowledge of the past. So historical knowledge that people could not have known at that time, some of which was discovered later by people. Number six is the knowledge about the natural world, what some people call the scientific miracles. Number seven is the elucidations about the uh, origins of life, where we came from, where we're headed, life after death. Uh, number eight, I would say another example that we'll explore is the existence of God, the attributes of God, his names. So a description of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, an understanding who, of who God is. Another uh, facet of Ijaz, number nine, would be the objective morality, the laws that came down. This is the course of 23 years, and now as a system, it changed the entire world with its guidance Do you mind describing and its laws. Yeah. that particular one uh, a little bit more before we get on to number 10 just because the rest like uh, are pretty straightforward i think they make a lot of sense and now that you've framed them in that it actually mashallah um it's it's pretty clear but the objective morality do you mind just explaining that and how important that is in in the context of a 21st century muslim living in the west excellent so uh, as we all know, uh, morality for some people is subjective. They'll claim that it's based on whatever people want, whatever society says. And that's very problematic because we can ask some questions uh, about famous incidents that are taking place during our times or they've taken place in the past. We can ask, was that morally evil? And most people, if not all people, say yes. Now you can ask, was it a fact? Was it factually, objectively evil? And most people say, yes, it's a fact. Now, for it to be a fact, it has to come from an external source. One plus one equals two is not my opinion. It's not based on my feelings. It doesn't change based on what society desires, what's acceptable today and basically rejected in 50 years. It's something that is timeless because it is a fact. So with morality, we believe that it's one of the, first of all, in philosophy, one of the arguments uh, for the existence of God is the argument from morality. With the Quran, we are saying as Muslims, theologically and philosophically, it suffices and provides a rational foundation for uh, the existence of God and objective morality with all of its frameworks. You, everything you need as a framework to live life, uh, we extract from it as the scholars have done, the principles to uh, provide a system of morality that is pleasing to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in terms of societal interactions, in terms of you know laws, in terms of uh, code, in terms of you know, how people interact, transactions, uh, family relations, all that stuff, that's explained in objective morality. The principles are extracted out. Some of the rulings are very explicit. They are timeless, like the prohibition on uh, intoxication. Generally speaking, it is known amongst all Muslims uh, that it is prohibited. And if there are exceptions to any of these laws, they are explained, obviously, uh, amongst the scholars in the books of jurisprudence. So, we take these timeless principles and again, timeless laws as well and the boundaries of the Sharia and the scholars of fiqh jurisprudence will apply these in different uh, situations, different contexts, different times. But essentially, 
the morality itself is timeless. The, the, the framework to live life for guidance, for the success of all people, not just the individual, it's timeless. And so in a way, this contradicts or conflicts with the predominant ideology spreading in the world today of liberalism, one form of which yeah, one form of which is about the individual desire, and one form of which, and I, I say one form, uh, includes the uh, t a type of self-worship based on my desires. So long as I'm not harming other people, what's the problem with doing X, Y, Z behind closed doors? Or as long as it's two adults, what's the problem with X, Y, Z behind closed doors? But in Islam, it's about, first of all, the truth, that it's not just about desires, that you pursue the truth over your desires. And number two, society has a right that is greater than the right of just one individual. And so if it's going to harm society and it's going to uh, lead to the, the downfall, deterioration of society in the future, uh, the, 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 the rights and the well-being of all people take uh, precedence over the individual. And this is an example of the objective morality. Barakallah Fiqh. I'm going to go through the nine that um, you mentioned and correct me if I'm wrong. So the uh, inimitability of the Qur'an and no one else can, can do it. Um, no one else can write it. Um, uh, I think that's that's pretty clear. The linguistic uh, uh, miracle or miraculous nature of the Qur'an. Um, the uh, knowledge of the future, I think, was, was one of them. The historical uh, knowledge. Uh, so knowledge of certain... Uh, aspects of uh, from history that no one else could have known at that time um, uh, explanation of the origins of of mankind I think that exists in the Quran that that's that's uh, um, that's pretty clear the attributes of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala the objective uh, morality have I missed any yes there were so two other it. ones no problem yeah, okay. the preservation of the Quran as well as the knowledge of the natural world, what we said people call the scientific miracles. All right, and I have and three the more. number 10. So okay, it's not mashallah. 10 here. I, these are examples, and I think these are in the very first article. Uh, so let's say uh, 10, 11, 12. Number 10 is the ease by which the Qur'an is memorized. This is uh, a claimed facet of Ijaz. Number 11 is the lack of errors and contradictions. This is mentioned in the Qur'an as well. And number 12 is the personal experiences related to the Qur'an. And this means the personal experience spiritually, psychologically, the shifa, the healing, the guidance, the psychological fulfillment, transcendence, motivation. It takes care of you in times of hardship, provides for you resources uh, to, to be resilient and strong, the impact on the physical body in terms of shifa, the impact on the mind, the spiritual curing, the exorcism. All that stuff is personal experience related to the Qur'an and essentially the way that it changes people and therefore changes uh, civilizations over the last 1400 years, we've clearly seen that. So these are 12 examples of facets of the Hajjaz al Quran. Sheikh, like now that you've mentioned the 12, um, honestly, it's a little bit overwhelming for someone like me who, you know, I, I have had other priorities with regards to the Quran, you know, memorization or tafsir or um, tajweed. Uh, there's a lot to unpack here. Uh, what would you say is a good way to start that journey of understanding? The miraculous nature of the Quran because the more you talk about it the more I will appreciate the Quran and the more I think I would get closer to the Quran and and really try to build that relationship with the Quran so what would you say is is the right approach to to explore uh, those 12 aspects so in terms of the 12 uh, categories of Ajaz, I would say the study of the topic first and foremost, a basic uh, intro, a basic understanding, and inshallah ta'ala, that's what our series with Yaqeen is uh, establishing. Uh, and in terms of that, that stronger connection, I would say there has to be a daily, a daily relationship with the Qur'an. Uh, it's mind-blowing that someone could know the value of the Qur'an and the rights of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and the purpose of life with so much clarity and then not recite the Qur'an or connect with it on a daily basis. It's like that individual uh, thinking and feeling to themselves that water or sleep are unimportant today. And it's even greater than that because the body might struggle, but the soul needs to survive. The soul needs to succeed. Um, the death of the body is saddening. The death of people is saddening. But the death of one's heart is even more frightening because there's still the eternal life. There's still a departure. When you know the value of the Qur'an and the fact that it is from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, 
you then place a, a value, you place a priority. Imagine it's a number on a scale of one to 10, where it's prioritized for you on a daily basis. How important is it to you that you're connected to the speech of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? When you have clarity on that, you can ask yourself, what will motivate me to connect deeply with it? And give yourself a list of motivators, write them down. Uh, the examples of the ajaz that you mentioned, those are all some examples that could motivate people, that it will heal, that it will cure, that it will guide, that it will remind, motivate, inspire, all that stuff. And in addition to that, ensuring that the environment around us and the things we're listening to are conducive. So a person who listens to audio frequently should ensure that they're, they're using a significant amount of time to also listen to recitations of the Quran, which by the way is a blessing we have today that people in the past did not have. You can listen to millions of recordings of the Quran anytime you want from all types of reciters all around the world. And you don't even have to recite if you're tired, exhausted, about to sleep, uh, multitasking, but you're, you're, you're listening. So that's another blessing that we have that a lot of people don't take advantage of. Um, and then of course, lastly, studying the meanings. When you understand what you're reciting, you're reading the translation or the tafsir, you're taking classes to seek knowledge on the Quran, naturally you'll find yourself more connected to it and you'll have a Quranic worldview. Allah Ta'ala. Zakallah khair. One final question on the topic, Sheikh, before we get into our notorious rapid fire uh, set of questions. If my nine-year-old niece came to you um, and asked you a very, very simple question, why is the Quran a miracle? What would be your answer to her? That's a great question, a nine-year-old. Uh, so I, I have explained this to uh, nine-year-olds and seven, eight, even younger. It uh, depends on the child, but generally speaking, um, I'll try to simplify as follows. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sent us a message from him so that we know how to live, so that we know what's good and what's bad. And if anyone ever asks, how do you know this message, the Quran, is really from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, we can say, look at how it's perfect in every way. Sometimes when we speak or we talk as human beings, we make mistakes, or we might even say something today, and then in one year we forgot, or we contradict ourselves, we say the opposite tomorrow. We're humans. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is perfect. His speech, the Quran, is perfect. So the Quran, when we study it, when we read it, we see how perfect it is in the language when we're reading it and listening to it. And importantly, it was saved, it was preserved since the time it was given to Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam so that no human being could change it or mess with it or modify it. In the Quran, there are details, information Allah tells us that no human beings can possibly know. For example, I would ask this nine-year-old, can you know the future? Of course not. We don't know the future. But the Quran has information about the future that came true. And so the believers knew very clearly, see, this is from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Can you see the angels or the afterlife, what's coming when we die? Of course not. But the Quran has those details. And most importantly, it came down to Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And what do you know about him? His character. He always spoke the truth. He never lied. He never learned how to write. He never learned about poetry. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala chose him to deliver the message to us. And if we know he's always speaking the truth, it makes sense as well that Allah chose this individual, Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, to be the final messenger with the great miracle of the Quran. Jazakallah khair, barakallah fiqh, Sheikh. Um, we're going to change gears and get into our rapid fire set of questions. So uh, are you ready? Sure, tafadal, rapid fire. Yeah. All right, very, very quick and easy one. Um, your favorite qara of the Quran. As someone who's gone so deep into the miraculous nature of the Quran, who would you say, you know, is is your favorite reciter? Uh, I'm going to answer this in two ways. It depends on my mood and it depends on the surah. And also I grew up listening to a variety of reciters, including Al-Ajami, Shatliri, Husari, Minshawi, Al-Kandari. And the most recently, the reciters I usually listen to are uh, Al-Qattani, Nasr Al-Qattani, Idris Abkar, and Haytham Al-Dukhain from Qatar. Okay, I've never heard um, uh, Ad Dukhan. I've never heard him. Excellent but, um, reciter. Nasser Qatami, yeah. my, um, my two nephews, alhamdulillah, memorized the Quran and they had a small, uh, uh, when they were actually 10 and 12, um, they memorized and they did the um, Ijaza and they were living in Riyadh at the time and Nasser Al Qatami and Abu Bakr Al Shatri were there um, at their house to, to gift them with a gift. Oh, and uh, I'll never forget. I'll never forget what Nasir Qatami, uh, his advice to them, 
And subhanAllah, one of those um, uh, nephews of mine is getting uh, married and they're recording a message for them. And for them, it was, how could you be living in the West? Like, obviously they haven't traveled to the West. So his message was, if you're going to live in the West and in an environment where you're not hearing the Quran blasting from the speakers or the adhan, then the Quran is literally your your only hope of staying on the right path. That was kind of the message and that kind of Asha stuck Allah. ten from 10 years ago. So that's beautiful. Jazakallah khairan for saying that. Um, what was the last book you were reading? The last book. So I'm reading multiple books at the same time. Uh, the last book that I was reading actually was this morning. Uh, Ibn Taymiyyah's Theological Ethics. Man, serious. It's like such a different level. Uh, of course, you're a Harvard graduate, so I wouldn't expect anything less. Jazakallah khair. Um, if there was one person you could have dinner with uh, who has passed away and he can't be the Prophet Sallam, who would it be? Uh, probably Abu Bakr radiallahu anh, for advice. Is there for any particular reason? Just because of his status as the, the greatest follower in this ummah radiallahu anh, uh, and also the, the knowledge that he would share, the advice that he would share. I, I would say Abu Bakr or Umar radiallahu anh, Umar. Umar radiallahu anh, because he ruled for uh, a longer period of time than Abu Bakr radiallahu anh, and per perhaps a lot of the experiences that the Muslim ummah went through uh, he would be able to share some of those experiences as a Khalifa. Mashallah, Zakallah khair. Um, you're based in Michigan. You've got uh, cities like uh, Dearborn who, that are famous for Arabic food. Um, of course, as someone living in Sydney, I would I would say it's probably second or third tier compared to Sydney Lebanese food. But <laughs> what would you say um, if you ha if you had any recommendations? If I was to come and visit you, is there any particular uh, restaurant or a type of food that exists in your neighborhood that you, you would really um, want someone to taste? So initially it was mostly Lebanese food, by the way. So you probably enjoy it more than Sydney. Okay. And right. uh, it started to change. It's very diverse now. We have a lot of, uh, we have Iraqi food, Yemeni food has increased a lot recently. It's really good. Oh, well. uh, Palestinian, Syrian as well, mashallah. But most importantly, if you were to come to Dearborn, I'd invite you to our house, inshallah ta'ala. Oh, inshallah, uh, consider it accepted, inshallah. <laughs> um, one final question. I kind of think I have the answer to this, but if you had unlimited resources uh, to put together the ultimate resource for the Muslim community, what would it be? If you had asked me this more than five years ago, I would say something like Yaqeen Institute. So may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala reward Sheikh Omar Suleiman and every single person who helped to facilitate everything that Yaqeen is doing. Uh, at now, yeah. uh, now that it exists, alhamdulillah, I would say a global connective learning experience like the Tarbiya project that we launched at Al Maghrib Institute. This is something that I've been working on uh, for several years. We just launched this recently. Now, the larger scale vision is that this is a personalized learning experience for all Muslims. And yes, even for non Muslims wanting to learn about Islam that starts you off where you are in your journey. So it's curated, customized for your growth, your development with qualified mentors and spiritual guides. So you're no longer consuming video series on your own and then maybe kind of uh, discontinuing after a while or losing motivation. Rather, it's consistent levels and structures, 10, 15 people per group with a qualified spiritual guide or mentor. Uh, and it, it's structured in terms of its curriculum. It's curated for this uh, audience, depending on their ages, where they live, their experiences, what they need to learn. And they continue through this journey with a mentor. And that's how many of our great scholars became who they were. They had that mentorship that a lot of people are lacking today. So I would say something like the Tarbiya project that we launched at Maghrib Institute, but on a global scale, inshallah ta'ala. Jazakallah khair, Shaykh Suleiman Hani. We could go on for ages, but I'll, I'll pause it there, inshallah, and save something for the next season of Double Take. Jazakallah khair and barakallah fiqh. Jazakum Allah khairan, barakallah fikum. Thank you for having me. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah.